A single engine propeller driven airplane has four left turning tendencies. The first one, as you can see, is spiraling slipstream. The propeller spins clockwise as seen from the pilot's seat. As the propeller spins clockwise, the air blasting backwards off the propeller makes a swirl around the airplane and strikes the tail on the left side. The airplane rotates around the vertical axis, causing the airplane to turn to the left. That is spiraling slipstream. The next one is torque effect, and torque effect comes from the way the engine uh, causes the propeller to turn in one direction. Remember, Newton again says for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So with a rapid increase in uh, throttle, the propeller turns harder, causing the airplane to roll. Now this affects us differently on the ground and in the air. If you're on the runway and you're ready to take off, when you first add the throttle, the airplane accelerates forward, but it also starts to rotate toward the left or roll to the left. But since the airplane is on the ground, it can't very well roll, but it will apply more pressure to your left tire. If you apply more pressure to your left tire, it's going to cause more drag. And if more drag is on the left wheel than the right wheel, as you're going down the runway, it tries to make the airplane yaw off to the left. To counteract that, you would use more right rudder to keep the airplane going straight down the runway. So the more horsepower your engine has, the more torque effect it's going to have, the more right rudder you would need on takeoff. Now in the air, let's say that you had your RPM set on 2100 RPMs, for example, and you suddenly increase the throttle. When you increase the throttle, you're increasing the torque on the engine, which in return turns the propeller and causes your airplane to start a slight roll in the opposite direction. So torque effect is a uh, yawing motion on the ground and a rolling motion in the air. Uh, P factor is a little tricky to understand. Um, P factor actually stands for propeller factor, but I like to think of it as pitch factor. I'm going to use the other airplane for demonstration purposes. It has a larger propeller on here. And if you look at how the relative wind comes toward the propeller, and the propeller is twisted, so one propeller blade is twisted this way, and the other pro propeller blade is twisted backwards, and each propeller blade has its own angle of attack. How the uh, propeller bites into the wind causes an angle of attack. Remember, angle of attack was a line from the uh, leading edge of the wing to the trailing edge of the wing in relation to your relative wind. Well, the propeller is shaped just like a wing. The back side is flat, the front part is curved. So as the propeller slices through the air, it works just like a wing. It creates a low pressure in front of the propeller that pulls us forward. But it's also twisted like a ceiling fan, so it helps corkscrew through the air to propel us forward. Um, when we're flying straight and level, the relative wind comes straight at the propeller, and both the descending and ascending sides seem to take the same bite out of the air. They have an equal angle of attack. But when the airplane is pitched up like this, the relative wind will strike from underneath the airplane. Because we don't have enough thrust to propel us straight up like a you know, fighter jet, we kind of drag through the air as we climb. And when we drag through the air, it causes the relative wind to strike underneath that propeller. If you look now at the angle of attack between the descending blade and the ascending blade, you'll notice that the descending blade, because of the relative wind coming from underneath, gets to take a big bite out of the air. It has a greater angle of attack. But the ascending blade on the left side, the wind actually hits almost the back side of it, so it decreases its angle of attack. It decreases the amount of work it's doing for us. So what happens every time you pitch the airplane up, keep in mind a single engine propeller airplane, every time you pitch the airplane up, then the right descending side gets a bigger bite out of the air and, and will yaw the airplane to the left. So anytime you pitch the airplane up, you hopefully will remember to apply right rudder to counteract that to keep your airplane flying straight because we want coordinated flight where the tail stays behind the nose in your direction of flight. Finally, <clears throat> gyroscopic precession. Gyroscopic precession is most noted in tailwheel airplanes, so it doesn't really pertain to our airplane that much, but I would like to bring it up because as a private pilot, you do have the right to also fly a tailwheel airplane with just a little bit of additional training and endorsement in your logbook. <clears throat> Gyroscopic precession means that when you have a gyro, something, an object spinning really, really fast, if I apply force in one area, because it's spinning so fast, the force applied is not felt until 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. So for example, as seen from the cockpit, your view, when the propeller is spinning like this, 
If I suddenly pushed the airplane's nose down, it's as if I'm applying force to the top of the propeller, but it wouldn't be felt until here. So you can see it actually twists the airplane on a different axis. I've tried to turn the airplane on this axis, but it actually twists this way. So gyroscopic precession says that when we apply force in one area, it's felt 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. Your propeller takes on that gyroscopic property. So in a tailwheel airplane, when the airplane is on the ground and they go down the runway, they push forward on the yoke in order to lift the tail up and then they leave the runway off the main gear. So at that moment, they still have the spiraling slipstream, the torque effect, the P factor, and now they also add gyroscopic precession in there. So at that moment, when they pitch the plane forward to put it up on its main wheels, it also tries to yaw forward, uh, excuse me, it tries to yaw to the left. So therefore, in a tailwheel airplane, they typically would have to apply a little more left rudder, correction, more right rudder uh, than we would in our airplanes. Now in our airplanes, we go down the runway and we pull back, we rotate, so it's as if we're applying force from underneath the propeller, but the force would be felt um, 90 degrees ahead of the rotation. It would actually be a right turning tendency for us when we rotate but that is really lost because the other three are so strong you never really feel the gyroscopic precession in our rotation. So on your check ride your examiner might ask you what are the left turning tendencies of your single engine propeller airplane and you want to tell them there's four. There's spiraling slipstream, that's how the, the propeller blast of air leaves the propeller and ends up striking the left side of your tail and the airplane yaws around that. Um, torque effect is where uh, Newton says or realized that for every reaction there's an equal and opposite reaction and that's where the propeller spins one way the airplane rolls the other. On the ground it's felt as a yaw force and in the air it's felt as a rolling force. And then P factor, remember it really stands for propeller factor but I like to think of it as pitch factor because every time we pitch the airplane up that's when that P factor takes effect and that's where the right descending blade takes a bigger bite out of the air and causes the airplane to yaw to the left. The more we pitch up, the stronger that force is. Um, gyroscopic precession is when you apply, if, if you have a gyro, which the propeller takes on those gyro properties, if you apply force in one area, it's felt 90 degrees ahead of the rotation that that force was applied and it'll yaw the airplane to the left. But it's most noted in tail draggers when they uh, are, during their takeoff roll, they push forward to get the tail up off the ground and get on their main wheels. So those are your left turning tendencies. So now that we understand what these left turning tendencies are, let's see how they affect us in flight. Now the manufacturer tries to eliminate as much of this as they can so we don't have to push right rudder the entire time we fly. And if we think about where do we spend most of our flight time, do we spend it in a climb, level, or descent? Well, level is where we spend most of our flight time. So what the manufacturer will do to compensate for some of this is they will apply a right turning tendency to the airplane when we're at cruise power. So if you're at cruise power, the manufacturer has a right turning force on that airplane, so it should fly straight and level hands off. The plane should be stable on its own. And manufacturers choose to do this in different ways. Um, some manufacturers will actually offset the engine. If you looked at a Piper, uh, for example, straight on, you'll see that the whole engine is offset. Some do it through rigging of the rudder or vertical stabilizer or uh, wings or different things. Um, they also can attach different trim tabs to it. And what they're doing is they're actually eliminating the spiraling slipstream and the torque effect for us. Unless we rapidly change the power in the air, you know, suddenly increase or decrease power, the torque effect would be uh, diminished basically because of the manufacturer, the way that they designed the airplane. But because this one it affects us when we're pitching the airplane, then we're going to have to compensate with right rudder uh, whenever we pitch up. So straight and level flight should fly the airplane. It should fly by, you know, pretty much by itself and stay straight and level. And if we were to make a turn to the left, we would clear left, make sure there's no airplanes over there. We would apply left rudder and left ailerons in that turn. And remember why we were applying that left rudder was because the adverse yaw. That's where the aileron came down on this side and tries to drag the wing in the wrong direction. So when we're turning the airplane, we're using the, the left rudder with the left ailerons in the direction of the turn. When I roll back out of that turn, then I would use right rudder and right ailerons to compensate to bring the plane back upright. If I turn to the right, I would always clear right, make sure there's no traffic on this side, and I would push right rudder with my foot and right ailerons with my hands 
and turn the airplane and then to roll out I would use left rudder left aileron to roll out. So straight and level turns we're going to use left rudder left aileron right rudder right aileron they go together. But if we're climbing as soon as you begin to pitch that airplane up it's going to want to yaw to the left because of our P factor. So as soon as we pitch up if we want to maintain our heading you must apply right rudder. The more you pitch, the more right rudder is necessary. The more horsepower your engine has, the more right rudder is necessary. So if I were having to hold right rudder in a climb just to keep the plane flying straight and level, what would happen if we bank the airplane to try to make a turn? This aileron comes down, so it creates more drag, so I need extra, extra right rudder in a climbing right turn to one, compensate for the P factor, and two, compensate for my adverse yaw. Let's say I wanted to make a turn to the left while I'm climbing. Well remember, as soon as I pitch up, the airplane wants to yaw over there. So if I made a left turn in a climb, I would clear left first, and really just release the right rudder that I was holding to keep me straight, and go ahead and bank the ailerons. So a climbing left turn usually doesn't require any rudder whatsoever. A climbing right turn requires extra, extra right rudder because I have to compensate for two things, the P factor, um, excuse me, the P factor and the adverse yaw created by the downward deflected ailerons. Now what about in a descent? Well, it depends on if I have power or I've uh, reduced the amount of power. If I just do a power on descent, like I just pitch the nose down and retrim it and let it accelerate, if I make a right or left turn, typically the same amount of rudder pressure is required in both directions. But what happens if I reduce the power to allow the airplane to descend? Remember I told you that the spiraling slipstream and the torque effect was compensated by the manufacturer at cruise power. They've put a right turning tendency on that airplane to make it fly straight. So if I pull the power away from it, the airplane will actually drift slightly to the right because at that point, without that power, the manufacturer has overcompensated for this. So therefore, if I reduce power, it may require a little bit of left rudder pressure to keep the nose straight. So if I were to make a left descending turn with power reduced, it would uh, require a little bit more rudder in that direction than if I were making a right descending turn with power reduced because the airplane already wants to yaw in that direction so it would not require as much rudder. So just to summarize again the rudder usage in a single engine propeller airplane. If we are flying straight and level, it should not require any rudder to make us fly straight. If we make a left turn, it should require left rudder, left aileron to roll out, right rudder, right aileron. If I want to turn right, right rudder, right aileron to roll out, left rudder, left aileron. They go together. But in a climb, we already have to hold right rudder. So if I need to make a turn to the right, it requires extra right rudder to keep it coordinated. If I want to make a turn to the left, I really just release that right rudder that I was holding and allow the plane to, to coordinatedly almost turn itself. If I'm in a descent, a descent with power, the rudder and aileron will work the same as straight and level. But if I descend with power reduced, then the plane's going to want to yaw to the right a little bit on its own because the manufacturer had overcompensated. So if I make a turn to the right, it will not require a lot of right rudder in a descent with the power back. If I make a turn to the left, it will require a little bit of extra left rudder in order to make the plane stay coordinated in that turn.